Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Jane Dawson. I'm the Virginia Eason Weinman Class of 51 Professor of Environmental Studies and Government, and I'd like to welcome you to this pre-conference special event tonight. As most of you know, over the next several days, the Goodwin Nearing Center for the Environment will be hosting a two-day conference on the quest for global environmental equity, and it officially kicks off at 12.30 tomorrow in Evans. However, just to whet your appetite to the kinds of global environmental justice discussions we're going to be diving into at the conference, we're holding this pre-conference Jean Thomas Lambert Endowed Lecture, and hope you'll be inspired, and I think you will be inspired, and join us for more of the conference proceedings tomorrow and on Saturday. Today's speaker yes, is someone of immense energy and talent, ingenuity, persistence. Um, Melina Labucan Massimo, close enough, okay, um, has come to us from Alberta, Canada, which is a long ways away. Um, she is a tar sands climate and energy campaigner with Greenpeace Canada. In addition, she's also a member of the Lubicon Cree First Nation, which is located in northern Alberta. And she's been working as an advocate for indigenous rights for over a decade. With the Canadian Tar Sands Project threatening the Cree Nation and their landscape, the pristine northern environment of Canada, and the climate of the entire planet, um, opposition to the Tar Sands Project brings together both her commitment to defend the rights of indigenous peoples and cultures and her passionate commitment to the environment. Melina is pursuing her master's degree right now in environmental studies from York University, and she's worked on numerous campaigns for environmental justice and indigenous rights in Australia and Brazil and Mexico and Canada, and it probably goes on. Um, her talk today is entitled From Our Homelands to the Tar Sands. And please join me in welcoming Melina Labucan Massimo to Connecticut College. Hi, hi. It's really good to be here. Um, and first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Pequot and the Mohican peoples of the original peoples of this land. As an indigenous person, when I go into other people's territories, I like to recognize um, who were the original stewards of the land here. So um, it's really an honor to be here. Um, I've been in touch with the college since last year about coming here. So it's been a long time coming, and it's really good to to see all of your faces here and your interest in the issues that we're dealing with. And, and I'll talk a little bit about what we're dealing with back home, but how it's actually related to here, um, which I think is something that some of the students I was talking to earlier didn't actually realize. Um, and so I think it's something that connects us all um, in certain ways. But I really like this quote that to start off with. Um, it's a it's a doctor, a professor out of the University of Alberta. Um, he's been a, he's a world renowned water expert, and he's been working on water issues for the past 30 years. And this is what he says about the tar sands. He says there is nothing on this planet that compares with the destruction going on there. If there were a global prize for unsustainable development, the tar sands would be the clear winner. So just to give everyone a geography, a quick geography lesson about where we're talking about, um, this is the province of Alberta. So um, it's the traditional territories of the Cree, the Dene, um, in the south, the Blackfoot, the Bloods, um, the Beaver. So um, there's a lot of indigenous peoples originally in these in these lands, but this is now Treaty 6, 7, and 8. Um, and so where we see the three um, deposit areas, so you can see the three splotches. So um, off if that's okay. So you can see actually the three splotches. Where I was born is actually the one on the left. It's called the Peace River region. Um, and the, the second one over is actually the Fort McMurray, the Athabasca region. And in the south, you can see the Cold Lake region. So there's actually three deposit areas of char sands that, um, where extraction takes place. If you look and see the red, that's where the actual service mines are. Um, and then if you look at the purple and the yellow, that's where the administrative area and the, the other deposits are with it in situ or underground mining, also known as um, steam assisted gravity drainage, which is called SEG D. And I'll explain a little bit about why, what, what the differences are and why that's so important to know those, especially because um, you're the recipients of a lot of our oil now, um, not just from the tar sands, also conventional sources, but Canada is actually the number one supplier of American oil now. Um, so just to give you a little bit of the background of the community that I come from, 
very northern community I was born in that peace region that I showed you that's actually my dad in the top left hand corner so he was very much brought up in the boreal forest in the bush as we call it and um, that's when he was about five so he lived with my grandparents um, there was these missionary schools that um, basically where a lot of the native kids were taken from the communities and forced into these schools they actually hid him from those schools because they feel, figured out how bad they were because he was the youngest so my kukum and my musum um, kept, kept him from these schools and they, they, he grew up in a somewhat of a traditional way and he didn't actually go to the day schools until one opened nearby when he was about 10. So he um, spoke up, spoke um, Cree growing up and my grandparents also spoke Cree and that's our tradition, as we say Nihiao, it's our traditional language and um, very much a northern isolated community, very lovely in the Boreal Forest which is one of the last remaining pristine forests in the world. Um, it's called the Lungs of the Earth, it wraps around the northern section of, of the planet and it's actually a way for us to keep our carbon emissions down, but I'll talk about, about how that's changing now because of the deforestation happening in our area. So a little bit of a story um, to kind of give you an idea of what's happening to a lot of the communities in the north. Um, the community that I come from, currently already, there's 2,600 oil and gas wells in our traditional territory. 70% um, out will be potentially leased um, that are given out to companies in the area. There's possible plans for nuclear development. And I really like this because it gives you an idea of what's happening. But since 1978, over $14 billion have been taken out of our traditional territory in like resources, um, natural gas, oil. and um, a lot of the communities actually still live below poverty lines, so my family still has no running water to this day, which is pretty surprising for a first world country. You know, we think of Canada, where, but yet indigenous communities aren't living um, the kind of lifestyles or the kind of the what we think of that would be a traditional seen as a traditional lifestyle of a Canadian person. Um, so what's happening is this is a really helpful, helpful map that Amnesty International um, developed that shows the leases that are actually given out in the traditional territory. We call the teardrop. This is where my family lives, so this is Little Buffalo. Um, and so 70% are already leased out for future development. So all those are like oil and gas leases. And there's actually 1,400 square kilometers of just in situ tar sands development in Lubicon territory as well. So this is just one of the stories of the many, the dozens of communities that are dealing with tar sands extraction in the north. So this is a, also a map of North America. And it shows the type of infrastructure that's needed to sustain tar sands extraction. Um, so we, we call this ground zero as you, where the extraction's happening. And um, it goes out, you can see all these pipelines here, the purple is the pipelines, these little guys are refineries where they need to upgrade and refine tar sands. In the north you see the natural gas pipelines that f that basically will feed tar sands extraction, so you use one fossil fuel to produce another fossil fuel. I'll talk a little bit more about that after. Um, but what we see happening is, for instance, the Trans-Canada North Central Corridor pipeline was built, which is this part section right here, built across our territory without the consent of the community. So what is this all for? Who's seen this picture before? Wow, really? Okay, this is the first time that no one's ever put up their hand before, so that's kind of exciting to me in a weird, morbid way. But um, basically, this is tar sands. This is a picture of what tar sands actually looks like. It's, it's not um, free-flowing, you know, the liquid form that we think of oil being. It's solid mass. And so this constitutes um, clay, silt, earth and bitumen, which is a technical term for tar sands, which is in this is 11 to 18 percent. So they actually have to remove all the rest of that solid mass to get at the bitumen. And then they have to upgrade it and take out some of the hydrogen um, and the carbon and add hydrogen and then um, create synthetic crude. So there's a different process of extracting tar sands than conventional oil. And this is the big difference. Um, these are mines, so there's two different kinds of extractions. One's mine, so surface mining. This here, this is an aerial picture, so this here is the biggest dump truck in the world. It's three stories high, so it's actually bigger than this building. Um, it's really massive when you see them drive by. It's like, well, you barely ever can see them drive by because they actually can drive over entire trucks. And so um, this, what they do with these surface mines is that they deforest the boreal forest that I was talking about, the pristine Asian forest, and they dig 100 meters down into the earth and get the tar sands. So this is what they're going for. So what they do is they have scrapers, and then they load up these trucks, and then they drive down 
the little paths or the big paths to the extraction site. So you can see the scraper digging into the earth. Um, so the reason why they do these surface mines is when the deposits are um, 100 meters and up, it's economically viable to get at the tar sands that way. But when the, the deposits are further down, like say a you know, couple hundred meters, that's when they'll do the underground mining. And I'll talk a bit about that and what the difference is. But what I like to show about, you know, what the, I really found this quote really staggering when I first came across this research. But since operations began, tar sands extractors have moved more than 1.4 billion, billion tons of what industry calls overburden, which is the boreal forest. This is more dirt than was removed for the Great Wall of China, the Suez Canal, the Great Pyramid of Cheops, and the 10 largest dams in the world combined. So we're talking about a lot of earth that's already being moved for tar sands extraction. Um, because basically, they, they estimate that it's like two to four tons of earth to make one barrel of oil. So it's a lot of earth that is being moved. And this is a picture. My friend Yerji took this picture, actually. It's from the air. So it shows the boreal. Um, it's already being drained. And then shows what it looks like deforested after. And then that in the back is a tailing pond, what I'll talk a little bit more about, which is the toxic waste um, pools or um, lakes really. So a tailing pond is the byproduct that's basically produced after the extraction happens. And so what's in these tailing ponds, if you look, this is to also taken from the air. So if you look at the tailing pond, sometimes it looks like water. It does, but up close, it actually, I'll show you a picture of what it looks like up close. But um, what is in these toxic sludge lakes are cyanide, mercury, lead, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, nymphatic acids, which are known carcinogens, heavy metals, VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Um, a lot of toxic, it's like a toxic cocktail essentially and we we know um, through certain uh, things that have happened in the past that birds specifically um, land on these tailing ponds and when they do they perish so there was one case happened in 2008 and with Syncrude where they got actually charged finally um, after 1,606 birds land, do, there were ducks um, that were migrating landed and thought it was a lake and landed on this one of these tailing ponds and, and they all died so that's thousands of birds, like over a thousand birds. So that's a lot. And so there's issues with wildlife that are migrating. Um, and then there's also, like I've heard from workers and I also looked on FOIP documents, which Freedom of Access to Information that had um, documents where it shows that, you know, bears, deers, wolves also can get into these because it's in the north, right? It's very, it's a very remote area minus these huge industrial projects that we see um, beside communities. But one of the really interesting things is, um, which is shocking and one it really makes, makes sense of why communities are dealing with health issues, elevated rates of cancers, is because every day in the tar sands from a, this research environmental defense did shows that over 11 million liters of toxic contaminants are leached into the Athabasca watershed, which goes into the Arctic basin. Um, so this impacts more than just communities downstream. It definitely impacts communities more so downstream, but even further further downstream. And um, it's a scary thing because, and people are like, well, why does it leach like that? Because they actually don't have these, like, they don't have synthetic, um, like, plastic coverings. It's actually, they just dig out the earth, and then they just flush the tar sand. So, you know, anyone that's made a sand castle, you know, you, like, make sand castle, eventually the water, you know, seeps in, and you're like, oh, where'd that water come in the moat? It's, you know, similar. It's like we don't have, they're not actually, um, because there's such big areas, which currently in the tar sands on the landscape, it's, it's 180 square kilometers. And so I don't know if there's a mathematician in the room, but I think for that is about 140 miles, square miles, but 180 square kilometers of just toxic sludge on the landscape sits on in the north. And that is because for every barrel of oil, we produce 1.5 barrels of toxic sludge. So that's pumping out right now as we speak. Um, so that's this is what it looks like up close. This is still an aerial photo, but it looks like an oil spill on land. This is on the ground, something that we took. So that's like a bitumen, they call them bitumen, kind of like scarecrows to deter the birds. Doesn't always happen. They shoot off propane tanks every 30 seconds, so it sounds like a war zone when you're on the ground. You're like, so it's like boom, boom, like every 30 seconds. So it tries to make it seem like the birds think, oh, someone's shooting at me, maybe I won't land. Um, so this is concerning as well, because not only is there contamination issues, but there's also water withdrawal issues. Um, where I was born connects with the Athabasca. So the piece 
Athabasca Delta is one of the six, um, what, one of the largest inland water systems like deltas in the world, and it's actually a sixth of Canada's fresh water supply. So um, this is this water is actually being used to produce tar sands. Um, and what happens that these this water actually flows north and goes up into the Arctic Basin. So it will these contaminants will reach the Arctic Ocean, the north. And where this water is coming from, who's been who's heard of Jasper? Jasper, Canada, yeah. Okay, so Jasper is a um, beautiful place in that borders um, the provinces of Alberta and BC, and um, it's basically so it's it has glacial it's like a glacial park and um, other like mountains it's a very mountainous area, so this Athabasca Glacier is actually starts in the Columbia Ice Fields in Jasper, and you guys there's a picture in 1919. In 1993, because of climate change, it's receding. And my cousin just went there a couple of years back for his wedding. And he's like, it's just receded even more. And so a lot of these companies are taking millions of cubic meters every day to produce tar sands. And this is where it's coming from. It's a pristine, finite resource. Um, for every barrel of tar sands mining oil that's produced, um, three to five barrels is the average estimate of how much water is needed to make one barrel of oil. So we're talking about a lot of water that's being used currently to produce tar sands oil. And the downstream impacts are staggering. Um, there's a lot of folks in the Dene and Cree communities and Métis folks that live in past these mining sites that fish, their fisher, their fishing communities. And they have white fish and they have all these different kinds of fish that, like here's an elder, he's taking the fish out. And what they're seeing to these fish is defined spines, um, malformed uh, fins and also like pustule like tumors on the outside. Other health concerns, this was taken in the Peace region. I was, was I wanted to take a photographer. This is um, the shell plant that was, this been here since I was born, um, near, not too far from my community. Um, this is one of the un underground minings and I'll talk a bit about of what underground mining is. Um, it's kind of more like similar to fracking but different. Um, so we see these signs in our traditional territories dotted all over the landscape. Poisonous gas, do not enter. Um, so that's a major issue for communities that live close to these types of extractive industries um, but because of that there's noxious gases being emitted into the atmosphere so that means emphysema is like the SO2 gases um, the NOx is the hydrogen sulfide so that means emphysema um, asthma pulmonary um, lung disease and that takes us to this other form of extraction which is the underground mining um, so this actually will potentially have a larger environmental footprint than surface mining, even though it doesn't look as insidious. Um, and and then the reason why I tell people, especially in the States and especially in Canada, is that we, we're already seeing ads put out by the oil and gas industry, especially the Canadian Associ Association of Petroleum Producers, that says, this is a greener form. This is green. We can make tar sands green. So there's a lot of greenwashing happening, but it actually uses four times as much natural gas, so therefore it produces more carbon emissions. They use still toxic um, extractive um, chemicals to to extract it and they're still by toxic byproduct. Um, but what happens is they superheat steam to 240 to 350 degrees Celsius. Um, they push it into the Earth's core into that steam injection. They get to the bitumen level that could be up to 1400, 1400 meters down. They melt the Earth's core and then they suck it back up in the, the oil side of things and then it comes to the surface. Um, so this is actually 80% of the way in which tar sands will be recovered. Um, so it's, it's, it's a huge area that we're talking about. And some of the issues is the fragmentation of the boreal forest um, because of SAGD taking up such a huge area. Because you know that first, part, that first map that I showed you that showed the different deposit areas? That in itself is actually as big as the state of Florida. So we're talking about tar sands, like as if there's tar sands all over the state of Florida and that's going to be mapped out for extraction, fragmentation, destruction of that area. So it's a huge landmass that we're talking about. Um, and because of this, this fragmentation, um, which is 141,000 square kilometers, um, we're seeing possible extinctions. For instance, the woodland caribou, which a lot of people are dependent on, many indigenous communities, very healthy um, wildlife, um, is basically set for um, extinction by 2040, which is in our lifetime. So in those regions, caribou will be extirpated, locally extinct in those regions because of tar sands extraction. 
And the reason being is because here's an idea of like what it looks like. This is also taken from the air, so you, it's not going to give you a you know, fit to scale, but these are piping, piping all along, right? There's a, a well pad. These are all seismic lines, so like hundreds of meters and kilometers. You can see this, like if you look at a plane in some ways, you could just, that's all you see across the landscape is this seismic exploration. And it really fragments the forest. And um, what will happen is, see, this is just one extraction site. There's already 95 of these across um, northern Alberta. And this is just, this is also taken from there. This is a Norwegian company, Stat Oil. Like, it's huge. I've been on this road here before. But um, this is what the rest of it looks like. And this is not even in operation yet. So it takes a lot um, of, um, to, to produce tar sands underground as well. This is a really helpful um, projection of what SAGD and mining will look like and how it fragments the forest. This was done by Pemin Institute. So this is actually a satellite image from space. Um, you can see Fort McMurray, which is one of the boom towns in the Athabasca region. You can see the, see those blue, those blue um, tailing ponds? Those are actually tailing ponds, the toxic sludge lakes that I was talking about. You can see them from space. Um, and this is the Highway 63, which they endearingly call the Highway of Death because it's a very dangerous highway to go on because there's so much industry going up and down into this kind of area. Um, Greg Royal Lake, Anzac, Fort McMurray First Nation, John VA First Nation. There's a lot of First Nations. And then there's some more north. And south of that is farming communities. This is what it will look like when they, when it's all said and done. These leases are actually already given out. This is what the fragmentation of the underground mining will do to the forest, and that's what the surface mining does to the forest. It just completely takes out the the forest, and then this completely fragments it. So as you can imagine, if you're a caribou or any kind of wildlife trying to get through your natural habitat, it's kind of made impossible, and that's why we'll see extinctions of local herds. Um, Another thing is trees. Um, because of the boreal forest being fragmented and deforested, that's a mine behind. So we're standing on top of these logs. Um, but that's a mine behind. And basically, if it's not um, viable um, wood for pulp and paper, they just let it die. And so like this is, some of these are poplars. That's like medicines. Um, those are certain medicines that are, you can actually use from certain trees. So steam leaks and explosions are another concern for local communities. Um, for instance, this was Total, a French company. They, when they're superheating steam and pushing it under, you know that hot, hot air wants to rise, right? We all learned that in probably grade four or five. All hot air rises. So when you push it down, superheated steam into the Earth's core, and you don't put the casing in properly, it's going to explode. So that's what happened. It pr produced a 300 meter crater from this French company in the Earth. And so it was, they called it a catastrophic explosion. But it, you can tell it, Earth, it basically is like brought up the melted Earth. Um, so it's really dangerous. We hear of sinkholes that happen, um, tractors and trucks falling in, people going too close to certain areas, their legs going in, um, explosions of pipelines. And I'll talk a bit more about pipeline spills in the next little bit here. Health concerns, like I said, H2S pollution. So you can see the plumes, the exceedances, um, the yellow dots in, around the tar sands and the tailing ponds. So people and workers are in these regions um, being exposed to these. Um, noxious gases, nitrogen oxides. Um, and then also, this is really interesting. Because we're using, so we're using so much natural gas, we're using one fossil fuel to produce another fossil fuel in the tar sands. So every day in the tar sands, we use enough natural gas to heat what would be equivalent to six million homes. So we're using just like so much natural gas to produce the tar sands. Um, if you put one energy, this is really interesting, and I think it really responds to why the price of oil is going up, 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 and doesn't really come back down. Um, it's only profitable, like, okay, so here we have one, in, one unit of energy invested for conventional, um, like the free-flowing, like, oil that we think of in the past. You get 100 barrels back, so 100 to 1 ratio. Tar sands, you put one unit in, you get three barrels back. So this is so expensive, right? You have to use more water, more energy. Um, produces more greenhouse gas emissions, and that's why um, it can't. They can't actually produce tar sands if it's below sixty-five dollars a barrel. Eighty, it's a bit more lucrative, and hundred, they're kind of laughing, which is currently hovering around right now. So, 
And this gives you a bit more, like shows you a thousand cubic meters per barrel. You produce one tar sand, one barrel of tar sands in situ, the underground mining. For the mining, um, the surface mining, it's four times less. So you actually use more for in situ. And this is 80, for the in situ, it's 80% of the way in which you have to extract tar sands. So the greenhouse gas emissions is going to go up in Canada regardless. Um, and that's one of the reasons why Canada pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol. Did anybody hear about that? when Canada pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol, right? So that means that they can't actually internationally um, stick to their binding agreements that they've made in, internationally to reduce their carbon emissions because they're just going up. Um, emissions right now, tar sands is the fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. 40 megatons we currently produce, it would, but they want to produce um, 3.5 million barrels every, by 2020, that would be 140 megatons. So that's why it's not, Canada's not able to meet any meaningful climate obligations. Um, and I think this is really irresponsible, especially for people that are concerned about climate change, which is happening all over the world. Um, I really like this um, quote from Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General, he says, every year 300,000 people die from climate change and millions more every year are made climate refugees. And Canada is just kind of contributing to that problem and I find that really irresponsible. As a project alone, tar sands produces 400 or 40 million tons, excuse me, which is bigger than actually entire countries of like say New Zealand, which produces 33.6 million tons. We use as a project alone more carbon emissions than entire countries. And this brings us to nuclear, and I heard there's a nuclear power plant close to here. But um, we actually don't have nuclear in Alberta. But they want to potentially bring nuclear to Alberta to produce tar sands, because if they're scared, they're going to run out of natural gas, which might not happen anymore because they're fracking so much in northern BC. But um, it's something that's been tabled many times. In the Peace region where I was born, they want to use um, the Peace River to cool the reactors and so currently there was two to 14 reactors that have been proposed then the people in the peace region really fought back against this and they said okay we're not going to do it right now and so now they're proposing mini nuclear reactors i don't know if people have heard of those but that potentially could be tabled again um, a couple of other concerns that we have, and then I'm going to go talk about oil, oil spills from pipelines, um, is the reclamation myth that I think a lot of people, especially in America, and I know like our premier who was in Washington last week, premier of Alberta, um, goes and says, oh, you know, everything's fine. There's no problems. I don't know what these environmentalists are talking about. These First Nation communities, they, you know, everything's fine. And so one of these myths that they talk about is reclamation, that they'll return these mines back to its original state, or even far better, because they've taken out tar sands, which is toxic. Um, so this is what we see in press material, like Stat Oil, who's Norwegian. Um, this is from a reclamation expert, Dr. Bailey. Um, and this is her before pictures. So this is what the Boreal will look like. You know, you can see the peatland moss. You can see how, like, it's very ecologically diverse. This is what they're looking at after. This is their reclamation. A tree farm. A tree farm, exactly. Um, because they, they're negotiating currently, and I don't know where it's at, but they've negotiated, they're negotiating with companies that if they destroy 10 species, say in the boreal forest, that they only have to put back three. Um, some of these researchers were pushing for five to seven, but we don't really see that happening, and that's what a tree phone results from. And you know, that's a very problematic for indigenous peoples that have used these traditional medicines on that land for thousands of years. That I still have, I learned from my dad how to harvest. Um, that are like immune boosters, that are painkillers, that are um, antioxidants like berries or like you can make tea. There's so many uses that. Indigenous communities still use, but obviously we're not going to go looking for that there. And they call that equivalent land use capacity. Thank you, Alberta government. So, this is very problematic because we have seen um, less than one square kilometer being certified as reclaimed. Um, that reason being, in the 40 years that we have already seen tar sands expand over in Alberta, um, they won't they won't take it up. It's kind of like nuclear liability, where they can't reclaim it. If the government reclaims it as certified, reclaimed, that means that it goes back into the problem of the taxpayers. So they subsume this issue. So if there's anything that goes wrong, if the toxic, if the toxic contaminants that they're burying and putting water over and calling end cap lakes surface, that means it's our problem. It means that taxpayers will have to deal with that. That, um, after the fact, when the companies leave. So as you can see, the woodland caribou, very problematic. 
possible extinction links, which I barely see, um, that are natural to the boreal, um, migratory songbirds that are natural to the boreal and um, go through the area and migrate. This is causing extreme issues for indigenous communities that have lived there for thousands of years. Um, Cultural, what we know, what we're saying is really cultural environmental genocide. Because of the further encroachment on the land, cont further contamination and destruction of our territories, it's resulting in a loss of culture, traditions, and customs. Um, you know, because we can't go fish, or we can't, like, this is when I was, I don't know, probably like 25 or 6, cutting like dry meat was for, from a moose that my dad hunted. Um, you know, being able to practice our traditional ways, drumming and singing and storytelling and a lot of other things that I won't go into, but there's a lot of things at stake currently facing our cultures, which has already been a challenge because of colonization. And this is what our landscape is being replaced by, and that's why it's such a challenge because we see industrialized landscapes. We see pipelines being built. This is the North Central Corridor, the natural gas pipeline in our territory. We see flaring. So, you know, we hear from elders and people even that are a number of years old, like couple in, the, in their like later 30s, that talk about how, you know, they when they used to go out in the land with their grandparents or with their parents and they would like take a dipper and like drink the water, you wouldn't even think to do that now, within our lifetime. And then, a uh, massive oil spill. Um, this happened, the anniversary will be two years in the end of April, April 29th. Um, this is a person. So we took this from the air. Um, it was really hard to get a helicopter because the oil and gas didn't, industry didn't want us to fly when this oil spill happened because it turned out to be one of the biggest oil spills in Alberta and Canadian history. It was 28,000 barrels, 4.5 million liters, which is bigger than the Kalamazoo. The Kalamazoo was like 3 million liters. Um, so it was, this was a scary thing because it was really close to where my family's homes are, about seven kilometers away or like a few miles as the crow flies. This is actually like a beaver lodge. So it just completely consumed the area where people have um, hunting grounds. My dad was born about 1.9 nautical miles by the water called Lubicon Lake. Um, this was, this is family members and people cleaning up the spill after the fact. We got, finally got in, they let us in two weeks after, after arguing with them about wanting to see the area. This is another taken from the air. So people, you can see um, some of the traditional areas. This is we, what we call muskeg or peatland moss. Um, and this is, it's kind of like outside right now because it's, it's, um, it's, it would be really green in the summer, but it's because it's like the springtime, it's still kind of um, kind of like outside where it's like the grass is still kind of browny and stuff, but it goes really green and really vibrant in the summertime. But this actually was all excavated. It was, it's completely gone now because of the oil. Um, but the scariest thing, I think, was when I was getting text messages from my family saying, uh, we can't breathe, our eyes are burning, um, I feel nauseous, I have a headache. Um, my auntie, who teaches in the local school there, um, who's taught there for 30 years, she was texting me and saying, like, can you find out what this is? Because we don't know and we're not being told by the company, by the government, what happened and what's happening. All we know is that we had to cancel school today. And so, because what happened was they were in the school and it got really, people were getting really sick and like the, even the principal was like, near throwing up and so they took they're like okay must be a propane leak inside the school and they took the students out into the field and it was actually even worse in the field and that's when they were like okay what's happening and so um so i started researching online and all i could find was a business website that said pipeline oil shut down due to spill possibly estimated right now a couple hundred barrels and that's all we could find for like the whole weekend and the spill happened thursday night friday morning Friday midday, school was canceled. All the weekend, still didn't know. Um, but we, more and more as time went by, we're like, okay, I think it's an oil spill. I called one of the counselors, one of the chiefs, and he's like, yeah, they're, they're confirming it's an oil spill, but we don't know what. They won't tell us any more information. And until a day after the federal election of the Harper government, <clears throat> which is the new government of the day, um, they finally released the information to this, the community the day after that election. And it came out by a one-page fact sheet that it was the biggest oil spill in Alberta history, or one of them. The one happened in the 1970s that was a bit bigger. 
and this is what my family was exposed to was the hexenes and the isobutenes are in hexenes is like one of the most toxic chemicals in the world um, that's what's released from oil when into the air when oil spills especially in huge amounts like that these are my cousin's kids and it was really scary because it was like Pregnant women, um, you know, my cousin was like, her, her daughter was pregnant at the time and said, we, should she leave the community? Should she be here? Shouldn't we be having an evacuation potentially? Elders that already have pre-existing health issues, small children, like these children, my cousin Vera's grandchildren. And it was frustrating even more so because we didn't get the information until five days after the spill. And then when we alerted the media, the media came up. They drove five hours north of the city and came into the community and said, what's happening? And then the government realized that, oh, uh oh, we have a PR issue on our hands. And they sent this poor woman in from Alberta Environment. And she's like, we've been on the site since day one. We've been here. Nothing's wrong. Everything's OK. And I said, can I ask a couple of questions? Because that's not really what I'm observing right now. And so, I, and so we said, you know, where have you been? Because we haven't seen you. If you've been on the spill site, then you need to specifically clarify where you've been. Because we have not seen you. haven't gone even into the school, because we're in the parking lot. You haven't even gone into the school and told the school, the teachers, the leadership. You haven't even communicated with them properly. Instead, you're talking to the media, because you're, you're more concerned about what's going to get out. And that was probably one of the most frustrating things to deal with. Another frustrating thing to deal with was 15 months later, after the oil spill, um, the company, which is Plains Midstream, a Texas-based company, um, was putting on their website every month, like, oh, we're cleaning it up. We've excavated. Um, things are fine. We're near reclamation. And so I asked one of the counselors to take me out, because he hunts there. That's where he's hunted. And he has a trap line. And this is what we found, which was like just a dead zone. There was no, like, there's no animals around, but we did see some wolf tracks. But we, what we didn't see, which the elders talk about, is when if there's life in the water, in the ponds, um, is that there's little, especially because this is July 5th, if, um, that there was, uh, you know, little bugs that float around and are on top, and that means there's oxygen, that means there's life. And this was just dead silence, nothing. And this is like we were scooping up like this. It was just mucky goo, and it smelled like byproduct, like petroleum. You can see there a little bit more black, and then you can see the counselor scooping out some of the um, black water. Um, this is actually the Kalamazoo spill. So this is the Michigan skill, spill. I met a woman from there, um, Michelle, uh, a couple months back. She was on the same panel. She was speaking about the spill. And the consequences were eerily sim similar. They didn't have an evacuation. They didn't have, um, they weren't being communicated from Enbridge, the company, what was happening in t a timely matter. Um, you know, but this was diluted bitumen, which would actually be coming through New England. Um, there's a pipeline that's being proposed through New England currently that would bring diluted bitumen. And the scary thing about diluted bitumen from the research that they've been doing is that um, it's so heavy, like I said, it's not very viscous. So it's, they need to put condensate, which is a deriv derivative of natural gas, into um, mix it with the bitumen, the tar sands, to make it flow and make it viscous enough to go through the pipeline because it's too thick. And so what happens? happens when, if there's a pipeline spill, like there was in Kalamazoo, um, the condensate is released into the atmosphere and it causes neurological issues that they're seeing with people in the Kalamazoo, Michigan area. Um, and the bitumen, because it's a very heavy substance, sinks to the bottom. It doesn't float on the top like sweet, like crude, natural, you know, more like conventional sources, and they use those skimmers. It sinks. And so that's why it took so long for them to clean it up in the Kalamazoo, up to two years. Um, for our community, it was about, like, just for the rest of the year, my family was there cleaning it up. My sister was the foreman, and then she texted me in December, okay, we're done now. But, I mean, we still saw what was left over. Um, but this community had to deal with it for over two years, and there's still some places cordoned off, and they opened up some of the other places. But it's very problematic. Um, we see this um, opposition happening along northern BC and southern British Columbia. 
with communities there, they don't want tar sands pipelines. And this is one thing that I've been learning more about this week as I've gone to, um, from Montreal to Vermont to Maine yesterday, tomorrow I'll go to Boston, um, about this tar sands pipeline that's being proposed for New England, um, which is a scary thing. It would come from us in Alberta, it would go to Montreal, and then the American side would go through New England to Portland where they would ship it out. So it's just something to be aware about, and that's why a lot of organizations in the area that I've been going to speak with about tar sands are very concerned, and they're very aware of these consequences that we've been talking about, or I've been talking about. Um, <clears throat> one of the things too, this is something in, in this is a this is an invitation that I've been putting out to many people because every year we have a healing walk in the tar sands. To, this year will be the fourth annual, and actually people like Naomi Klein, Bill McKibben, maybe even Daryl Hannah might come. A lot of people that have been doing KXL work will come to the source of the problem, um, which is the tar sands. And they'll walk. It's not a protest walk. It's actually a prayer walk, um, where we'll walk in four directions and and pray pray about these types of things in together as allies, indigenous peoples, people from all over, all, you know, all walks of life have come. And this is the fourth year in July. If you feel so inclined, come up to me after to talk about it. But we have delegations coming from as far as Montreal and have come, had people come from Europe and BC and the States. Um, just to end, this is two resources that um, might be helpful for you um, to research and look up and to share with your family or your community, whoever you want to bring this message to. Um, one thing we did was made a photo essay called Oil on Lubicon Land that basically just is a 10 minute photo essay of what I just talked about. Um, so talking about tar sands impacts and um, the oil spill that happened back home. And then another one, an Amnesty International report called Homelands to the Oil Sands, which is part of some of the slides that I used earlier that talks about um, kind of UN recommendations that the UN has done on behalf of our communities for the past 25 years basically citing Canadian, the Canadian government for violating international covenant. So that's a really helpful report too to kind of put things into context of what's happening and how it's being tracked and followed throughout the decades. Um, and so that's it. Hi, hi, thank you very much. Because I think sometimes it's like a PR thing, like, oh, look, we're employing local communities. Um, but also because people in the communities don't have a lot of economic um, like opportunities in other ways. When you're in the far north and you're isolated communities, you have to leave the community if you want to have a different job than oil and gas and logging a lot of times or whatever, the, the, the most extractive industry that's around your area. So I would say um, there's a lot of reasons, but one of them was just because like the, that's a job that's available. And so it's a scary thing too because it's my cousin's kid, um, he's Dakota, he's like, he was 19 at the time. Like they're not have they don't have their masks on and stuff. So I'm just like worried about the, what the long term impacts will be for the health of those of the people that are putting their lives at risk to clean up this spill from this oil company. But yeah, there's a lot of different reasons. But I'd say those are the two main ones that we could talk about more about after. But yeah. Um, I just have a question about activism. Obviously, the. Uh, the mining of the tar sands is horrible. Would, would you say there is a positive in that it has organized the Native community to be activist? Or has that spirit always been there, do you think? It's been there since like 1492. I mean, it's definitely been there for sure. Um, I mean, this this work has been done since before I was born, um, but I think less and less people didn't know about it. There wasn't that awareness or the voice be being given to these communities. Like my parents' generation, you might not see a Native person up here speaking before this college even. So I think it's just giving voice to um, these issues that we haven't seen, and I think it's also now, more and more indigenous peoples working with non-indigenous peoples as time goes on, working with environmental groups or whatever it may be on social justice and environmental justice issues, as we try to broaden our understanding 
to increase and have that dialogue that I think is uncomfortable for us to have between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities about colonization, what happened to communities, po governmental policies that were really detrimental to our communities. There's a lot of discussion that needs to take place, and I think that's been like the blockage um, in our parents' generation, um, say for like organizations that work on environmental issues, they weren't in touch with the communities that they were actually campaigning the land that they were campaigning on, and that needs to change, and that's slowly changing, but um, I think it's just seeing, it's, it's more visible now. It was definitely happening before, but it's just more visible now, and um, it just needs to increase, and I think that's why new alliances are being made, and that's why we see um, these types of things happening in, outside the ha White House in Washington with the Keystone XL tar, tar Sands Pipeline. When, oh, President Obama has to make a decision. Like It's becoming that much of an issue because I think people are like, we need to switch. We need to change. We can't stay on this path of fossil fuel-based um, paradigm. It, we, we're not going to be able to sustain this, and so I think it's um, becoming a bigger issue than just... Um, it's affecting all of us, and I think that's why, too, it's changing slowly. I, I was just thinking about how you came to our college from so far away and, you know, into another country, really, um, as well. And when I was listening to your um, speech um, presentation about what is happening in Alberta, I was wondering where the Canadian people were. You know, what is the best thing in Canada? Because, you know, you obviously came over here to talk to you us in the U.S. about um, Canadian car stands, and obviously that makes sense because the U.S. consumes so much of that, but I was just curious, where are the Canadian people on this? Where do they stand? It depends on what Canadian person you talk to, because some are pretty pro and some are pretty against. And there's, it's definitely this has been a polarizing issue. Um, and but the thing is, I'm just happy it's even an issue because five years ago, um, and there's a lot of hard work that's been done before I started doing this work. But five years ago, when I would talk to people about tar sands, they're like tar sands and Jane, like they're like that movie. You mean like they were just they didn't know what tar sands was, you know? And so it was like I'm like oh my god. <laughs> biggest industrial project on the face of the planet and nobody knows what it is like wow they are really winning the PR war on this you know so I think it's changed and it's become an international issue you know there's been work done in the UK there's been work done in other parts of um, Scandinavia and now in the US it's finally become an issue and I think that's why um, I do this work because people need to know they need to make an informed decision because if they're not even we're not even having dialogue about this we're going down a path without even you know being like blind sheep leading these politicians down the path that are in bed with big oil and not really looking at what are alternative solutions, what are renewable energy initiatives that we could actually be asking these politicians to put our taxpayer money into. Like why, one of the bigger questions I have in Alberta is why don't we have any investment in solar energies when it's one of the sunniest provinces in the country? And yet we see billions of dollars going into oil and gas to stay, keep us on this path. And so I think it's just creating that dialogue and that's why that's why I came here today. And to talk to you about also that you're gonna have a pipeline that would come from Alberta. So yeah, does that answer your question? Okay. There has been talk about that from not my community, but other communities that are downstream on the mining side of things, the Athabasca Chippewa First Nation. I mean, I've talked to their leadership about that. Like, they're like, we don't even know what to do. You know, there's like six mines already in existence that are as big as entire cities, you know, and the latest one is Imperial Oil, big as, bigger than Washington. They want to expand to more shell mines. So it's like, it's a scary reality that um, where there's elevated rates of cancers, like you have to consume the water, you need to drink that water. And when there's leaching of toxic contaminants into your watershed, that's a scary reality that you have to deal with and all the other things that are coming from the air, coming in the wildlife, on the fish. Um, so there has been discussions, but also indigenous peoples are pretty resilient people, and I don't think that we would be like leaving without a big fight. So, I mean, our, our ancestors are buried there from like thousands of years, you know? It's like, it's a part of who we are. And when you, you kill the land, you kill us. And so I think that's a huge thing, and I don't think that it's like, we're gonna be like, okay, time to move, like we gotta go. Mm -mm. It's not gonna happen. I know during the Clean Air Act, uh, Canada played a really big role in Congress and Senate in passing the bill and whatnot. Do you think that, uh, because I know the Harper administration is very against and they don't really believe in the tar sands and whatnot, so do you think they'd be persuading the U.S. Congress and the government to be pro 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, we definitely see lobbying efforts from the Canadian government for the past number of years coming. Like we just last week, we had the Premier of Alberta, I think I just mentioned this, um, come to D Washington, D.C. for the fourth time. And she just was reelected like a year and a half ago. Like. She's been here four times in the states um, because they're and they're doing the same thing with the um, clean. The, there's a climate policy that the EU, the European Union, is trying to erect that would kind of ban tar sands. They're going over there like they're just trying to sell this. You know, they're just like they're kind of like drug dealers. You know, they're like, no, this is really good for you. you need to have our oil. Yada. You know, we're all addicted and it's okay. We're just addicted. It doesn't matter. Like it's just it's really frustrating because she comes in, she comes here and she paints this really shiny picture, and that's not the reality that we're dealing with in Alberta. And I just kind of wish I could say to her, why don't you come live in, live with my family? Like, do you want to live in a place that has no running water that has to be deal with toxic emissions? Like, maybe come live that reality and walk like a day in our moxins and then like let's talk about it you know so I think it's a pretty, a pretty frustrating thing when there's politicians and I know that this happens here in the states um, I just came from Maine and like I heard their is it the governor not not very um, forward thinking and I think sometimes that's really frustrating because it doesn't reflect what we're dealing with on the ground and so that is happening unfortunately um, but that doesn't mean that people aren't listening it doesn't mean that it's it's a game over like I mean I like the, the, the Democrats invited me into the US Congress and I testified last year There's, they still want uh, the other side of the story and so that doesn't mean that because politicians are you know worried about their short-term campaign goals that that we still have to push back and say they're, they're there's actually longer term goals and longer term visions that we have as a society and as a human race. Because this is really, Jim Hansen, who's a NASA scientist, has said about the tar sands, if we produce tar sands to the extent that they want to, it's game over, essentially, for the climate. Anybody else? Right. Um, I think it's just because the the price of oil is so high that they can. When, say, for instance, 2008, when we saw the big collapse here, um, that it, that cancelled thousands of contracts, thousands of people lost their job in, tar sand, in the tar sands industry. Like people were going home, um, contracts were cancelled. Like I I was driving through part of that area, and Horizon Mine was one of the mines that, and it was just like a there was like a dead zone. There was like no one there. I was like, wow. And they just left the work. Like they were like, no, we can't produce. We can't, we can't compete. And that's why in the global market, the price of oil has to be so high and stay so high for us to, so it's like paying more money um, for oil and it's not going to go down. It can't go down. Um, unless the government subsidizes, like they have, they have, the Alberta government has been subsidizing a bit, $1.4 billion every year. They subsidize tax breaks and royalty breaks and um, subsidies to the oil and gas industry in Canada. So it's, it's happening, so it does help alleviate some of the price because it's so capital intensive, it's so expensive to produce tar sands. Um, there's been studies done even by unions, labor unions, like the Alberta Federation of Labor um, and Greenpeace, like a Green Blue, Blue Alliance that happened um, in 2009. And so we did a research that showed that for every million every million dollars that you put into tar sands or oil and gas you get three jobs back but if you were to put this million dollars into say renewable energy systems like um, transportation systems you get 25 jobs back we know that there's actually more return on investment if you put it into green sustainable jobs but we just we're not seeing the political will and so I think it's more about the political will than it's an economic question and I, they talk they talk about this fallacy of economy versus the environment but I, I mean I think if you look at all of the solutions that are out there it doesn't have to be that way I've been hearing a lot more about tar sands being against it as compared to traditional oil. Are the companies feeling any pressure from the organizations? Are they? They do, yeah. Pardon? Are they sweating? Sweating. Yeah, I'd say they sweat a little bit. Um, the thing is, is that the conventional companies that have conventional reserves are the same companies that have tar sands. So, I mean, I'm sure they wish that there was more conventional fuel for them to extract, but I think they're so, they're so um, dependent on the system that they're 
controlling like they're mon they're monopolizing you know they they're they have our energy grid system down like they do not want to give this up and that's why the oil and gas lobby is pushing so hard in the states in Canada to not give up this grid system like they want to control it and so they are sweating a bit you know they spend millions and billions of dollars on PR campaigns just like the Canadian and American governments do for to say like Obama clean coal like you know there's like the same thing like it's this greenwashing like we can't give this up you know you're going to give up your future and it's like I see communities that are self-empowering themselves I see a community on Vancouver Island in BC it's a first nation community they have one of the biggest solar panels in the country and they they're they're actually paying their off like they're the BC Hydro which is the provincial regulatory BC Hydro they they they're the ones that are have the grid um, they basically Basically, pay that community back, and so there's communities that are empowered to do these types of projects without the political will. They're just like, you know what, we're going ahead without you, and we're going to be left in the dust. I mean, you see countries like Germany doing this, you know, like it's just it's possible, but I think it's just like this fallacy that a lot of people are believing, and it's just not true. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely what a lot of people will call environmental racism. Um, you know, I one of the people that I know from the downstream community of Fort Chip, um, he talks about how, you know, if the Athabasca River was flowing the other way south into the big population of Calgary, which is like the white collar financial capital of Canada, really, and Alberta, because of that's where all the oil and gas companies have their headquarters, that it would be a different story, that we'd maybe, see, maybe be seeing more outrage, but because it goes north, that river flows north, that there's maybe not as much of an outrage, and, but I think that's slowly changing, but I think that that's what we see happening in, in North America is the environmental racism, you really put a map over North America, you see a lot of the industrial waste zones, nuclear development, a lot of the extractive industries happening so close to communities of color and indigenous communities. And that tar sands is not, you know, free from that. It's definitely happening in the tar sands as well. Um, that being said, it's also, it is also farming communities. It is also settler communities that are being impacted. Um, because I live in the Peace region, I get calls from farmers that are saying like, we're getting gassed out. Our cattle are miscarriaging. We're selling our farms. We're leaving our homes. So it's not, it's indigenous communities that are getting the brunt of the impact for sure, because we're the ones that are living off the land, connected to the land, super close in those remote areas. Um, but in other other areas, because there's been a lot of farming that's happened in those regions, there's, they're also starting to be impacted too. Um, so I think that does definitely, the Harper government is very um, particular. And you know what we see with uh, sec Bill C-38 and Bill C-45 was basically an overhaul of the environmental regulatory system in Canada. We saw over 100 laws and acts changed within one year. We've never seen that in Canada's history. We saw the oldest na water, na water, Navigable Waters Act, the oldest like, water act in history being changed by the Harper government. So that's why I don't know more erupted because it was just like, there. it was not only environment, but I, environmental issues are closely tied to indigenous issues because that's the land base. We're land-based people. We're, you know, but like all people, we're dependent on water. We're dependent on clean air. Um, and so that's why it became a Canadian issue. And I think the media tried to skew it as a native versus non-native issue. But we're like, no, it's actually going to affect all Canadians. Um, so, but that's why a lot of indigenous peoples rose up because they're like, this is, this is too much. Like, how could you not protect 99.9% .9 of the lakes and rivers in Canada? Like, how is that even possible? from a government uh, how can they that, how can they institute this and they had and they did they got away with it because they're in a majority government right now it's kind of like the Bush you know what Bush did in his in his era in his tirade you know um, but Harper is like Bush but smarter so beware people be very aware <laughs> Did I answer all your questions? 
Okay. Well, thank you so much for listening. Thank you.